for this wonderful uh, space that you've provided, and thank you all for coming out. Um, we, we're going to show a, a PowerPoint, but since uh, it doesn't seem to be working, I'm going to show first just that clip that David talked about. Um, this is from uh, the last Monday, this Monday, when we had just organized this drone summit. It was the first ever coming together of people from around the United States and from other places around the world to come together and say, what is going on with all these unmanned aerial vehicles that look like this is the new face of warfare and what are we going to do about it? And we heard during the course of the weekend just these devastating stories about what the drones were doing. And uh, the next day we found out that the head of counterterrorism for Barack Obama was speaking at an event at the Woodrow Wilson International Center. Well, I went online to see could we get inside, and it said, no, uh, invitation only. And I emailed and said, can we come? And they said, no, it's full, it's only invitation. So we said, all right, let's go outside and have our protest outside. Well, there's this wonderful guy in upstate New York who lives near a uh, air base that is used for piloting these drones. So upstate New York, pilots sitting in their cubicles, operating drones that are killing people in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and elsewhere. And he got very upset about this and started building these model drones, big, like, model drones that he takes to uh, malls and fairs and uh, educates people about what these drones are. So we said, all right, let's pull out the model drone and we'll take some flyers and just go out there and fly her. And I thought, well, I'm not sure which entrance uh, uh, the people going to this meeting with counterterrorism expert John Brennan are going in. Let me just go inside the building and check it out. When I went inside the building and checked it out, I saw they had the list and they were checking people off as they were going in. And I thought, what the hell? Let me just try to get inside. <laughs> and um, I went up to the front. They said, what's your name? And I like for a minute was like, uh-oh, what's my name? <laughs> I thought maybe I'll think of some generic name and they'll be on the list and then I'll get in and I, and I thought maybe someone will recognize me. So I said, all right, Benjamin. And she looked on the list and I could tell I wasn't on the list. But um, she seemed a little embarrassed that I wasn't on the list uh, because I looked like I was supposed to be in there. And she said, okay, go in and get, take one of the front row, front row seats. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I said, sure enough. And then I wasn't sure what I was going to do either because I really was not prepared. And I thought, well, you know, I'll listen to what he says. I know I'm not going to like what he says. Um, maybe I'll wait for the Q&A part. You know, if there are any questions and say something. But then when he started talking, I started getting really angry, and I started thinking about the stories we had just heard that weekend. And I'm going to play the clip, and, and he starts out by saying uh, that Al-Qaeda is killing innocent victims, innocent people, and that this is tarnishing their reputation. And I was, my head is racing, my brain, I'm saying, you know, that's a true statement. That's right. Al-Qaeda is killing innocent people and it is tarnishing their reputation. And he said, especially in the Muslim world. And then I'm thinking, well, yeah, but there's something else you've got to say right after that, which is, so are we. And we're supposed to be the democracy. We're supposed to be the model of uh, complying with international law and, of course, with our own constitution. So um, I realized he wasn't going to say that, so I figured I'd better do it. So let's see if this, this works here. Al Qaeda's killing of innocents, mostly Muslim men, women, and children, has badly tarnished its image and appeal in the eyes of Muslims around the world. Excuse me, will you speak out about the United States? What about the hundreds of innocent people we are killing with our drones? Excuse me, will you speak out about the Pakistan, yeah. and Yemen, and Somalia. I speak out on behalf of those innocent victims. They deserve an apology from you, Mr. Brennan. Yeah. Well, how many people are you willing to sacrifice? Why are you lying to the American people and not saying how many innocents have been killed? I Thank you, ma'am, for expressing your views. There will be time for questions and answers after the presentation. In, in uh, Pakistan, who 
was killed because he wanted to document the drone strike. I speak out on behalf of Abdul Rahman al Awadi, 16-year-old born in Denver, killed in Yemen, just because his father was something he do like. I speak out on behalf of the Constitution, yeah. on behalf of the rule of law. I love the rule of law. I love my country. <laughs> He decided to 
decided, okay, I'm going to go this other route and I'm going to document what is happening. So he came to the capital. Now, uh, he spent several days there and he learned how to use a video camera, use a still camera, and went back to his hometown. Lo and behold, three days later, when he was driving with his 12-year-old cousin in a car, he too was killed by a drone strike. Now, first, the U.S. government said, that wasn't a 16-year-old and a 12-year-old, they were militants. And after they're killed, the U.S. government always says that they were militants. Well, this 16-year-old was not a militant. He wasn't involved in any militant activity. Even if he were, he had just spent the last couple of days in the capital city, Islamabad, where they held the meeting was just not even a mile away uh, from the police station, from an army barracks, and from the U.S. Embassy. They could have very easily gone into the conference and said, you are a militant, we accuse you of crime, and we are going to arrest you and take you to court, which is what one is supposed to do when somebody commits or is alleged to have committed a crime. They didn't do that. They never tried to arrest him. Instead, they killed this young boy in a drone strike. And that's why I recalled his name when I was standing in front of John Brennan. And then I recalled another name, and it's another 16-year-old. And this is a 16-year-old, Abdul Rahman al-Awaki. He was born in Denver, and his parents moved to Yemen. His father, you might have heard the name Anwar al-Awaki, a radical cleric who was propagandizing against the United States from Yemen. So the U.S. had him on the hit list. Now, he is, too, an American citizen. And he, uh, one would think, would deserve to be captured and perhaps taken into court and perhaps have a chance to have a trial and see if, indeed, he was involved in militant activities, not just propaganda. Um, but he was not given that chance. He was killed in a drone strike in Yemen by the United States when he was in the car with another American, Samir Khan, who was also accused of propagandizing on behalf of Al-Qaeda, never given a chance to defend himself. Those two men were killed in a drone strike. The son, trying to find out what happened to his father, was driving in a car in Yemen when he was killed in a drone strike. Now, this is a 16-year-old who was never involved in anything. You can ask his mother, his grandparents, his friends. You can find him on Facebook. He was a normal kid, was not involved. Basically, uh, perhaps uh, our government killed him because of who his father was. Or what our government said afterwards is that he was not 16-year-old. He was 21 years old, and he was a militant. Not true. So my point is to say that these are individuals who are being killed. Um, these were people who deserve to have some kind of chance to defend themselves. I'm talking about teenagers, but we can talk about really young kids. Because according to a group that has done the best investigation on this in Pakistan, they say there have been 174 children that have been killed by our drone strikes. And uh, once again, we have not seen any of the pictures of these children. Now to step back a minute, let's look at why the Obama administration has taken it upon itself to move into this era of using drones. Drones, uh, you can trace them back to the days of Vietnam, you can trace them back to the, uh, the fight in the Balkans when the U.S. was experimenting with drones, uh, you can look back to the first Gulf War when the U.S. was experimenting with drones. But it was really 9-11 that was the catapulted drones into the forefront of the weaponry we are using for 21st century warfare. When, uh, in the year 2000, the Pentagon had maybe 50 drones in its whole arsenal. And now it has way over 7,000. These drones can be uh, surveillance drones, which is most of them are used for spying and surveillance. They can be as big as a commercial airliner, what's called the Global Hawk is a really big one. They can be uh, smaller, the size of a small airplane, uh, like the ones called the Predator and the Reaper drones.
homes, and these are the ones that are doing most of the lethal killing. Uh, they can be backpack drones that soldiers can put in their backpack and launch from the battlefield. And they're now experimenting with very, very tiny drones that are the size, they can be the size of an insect. They can be the size of a, of a hummingbird. Um, there's all kinds of drones now that are being developed. So I'm talking right now about the, the drones that are used to kill people, the lethal drones. And it seems that after many years of war post 9-11, the American people are finally getting sick and tired of war. And the polls are showing overwhelming opposition they did to the war in Iraq and now also to the war in Afghanistan. And in fact, the last poll that was taken in by ABC Washington Post in March showed that seven out of 10 Americans feel that the war in Afghanistan is not worth fighting. And that's pretty significant because, you know, when you're in the middle of a war and your soldiers are dying and everything, it's hard for people to come out and say, look, it's just not worth it. But what was really extraordinary about that poll is that it showed for the first time even a majority of Republicans were opposed to the war in Afghanistan. So gradually, this has been happening over the last couple of years, and in large part because of the work like David Swanson does and others in the peace movement, convincing Americans that these wars are not in our best interest. So the people who are in the Pentagon, in the White House, National Security Council, I would love to be a little drone fly on the wall that is listening to their conversations about how are we going to keep these wars going when the American people don't support them anymore. And one of the ways they have found is precisely through this new technology of drone warfare. And some of you might recall during the Bush years how, uh, how much opposition there was, not only to the wars, but to the uh, uh, the indefinite detention, capturing people and putting them into Guantanamo, how the majority of people we had in Guantanamo were innocent people that had just been in the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, how uh, many of us yelled and screamed about things like extraordinary rendition where they would snap people up and send them off to places where they would be tortured, uh, how we spoke out against the, the torture itself even being done by uh, our military and the CIA. We talked out about waterboarding. Well, the Obama administration spoke out about those things as well, but they came to a different conclusion, that rather than capture people, put them in Guantanamo, have the messy situation of, do we try them in military courts? Do we try them in civilian courts? Uh, if we let them go, who's gonna take them? They decided instead to just kill them. And that's what they've been doing. Just use drone strikes and kill. Now there's two kinds of ways that, that the CIA uh, and the Joint Special Operations Command are authorized to use drone strikes. One is they come up with a list of people that are on the hit list, and these are supposed to be high-level militants whose names they know. And they go out and look for these individuals. The other is called signature strikes. And this is when you are allowed to kill people on the basis of suspicious behavior. So you profile them. You look for people who are, have beards, turbans, carry guns, uh, go around in convoys, suspicious behavior. And that gives tremendous leeway for the CIA, for example, to be killing people without any proof that they are even involved in militant activities. So the places that we are using the drones the most is the spillover from Afghanistan into Pakistan. And there you have um, uh, over, there's th uh, 321 drone strikes that have been launched into that northern part of Pakistan to date. The vast majority, 85% of them, have been done under the Obama administration. In the book, I give examples of other examples of who has been killed. Uh, sometimes they actually get the right target, but they just happen to kill the wife and the children at the same time. And it's sort of like, well, oops. Um, sometimes, many times, they don't get the right target. Uh, I have an example in the book where they went 15 different drone strikes trying to find this one target.
target and killed over 150 people in the effort to get one person. And then many other times their targets are just wrong, like the examples that I, I gave of the teenagers. Um, there is a, a um, photographer that has been trying to document the drone strikes and uh, he puts his life at great risk because nobody wants this documented. The Taliban don't want it documented because they don't want to show the success of any of these strikes, so they try to get rid of all the evidence. Uh, the U.S. doesn't want it shown. The Pakistani government doesn't want it to be shown. So this man goes around and he says, um, sometimes there are just pieces of flesh lying around after a strike. You can't find bodies. So the locals pick up the flesh and curse America. They say America is killing us inside our own country, inside our own homes, and only because we are Muslims. Now this is the perception of people in the northern part of Pakistan. Another vignette. The Khan family never heard it. They've been sleeping for an hour when a Hellfire missile pierced their mud hut. Black smoke and dust choked the villagers as they dug through the rubble. Four-year-old Zarik's legs were severed. His sister Maria, three, was badly scorched. Both were dead. When their cousin Ifram, 16, saw them, he gently curled them into his arms, squeezed the rumpled bodies to his chest, lightly kissed their faces, and, sled, and slid into a stupor. So these are some examples of what is happening with these drone strikes. Now, in the very beginning, the Pakistani government said, all right, we'll work with you. We want to get these militants too. Um, you just be careful, you just get the guys who are the bad guys, and uh, we will pretend that it's our Air Force that's doing it. And that was only discovered through WikiLeaks. Well, it turns out that the Pakistani government realized when these strikes were just one after another after another, that it was not working because it created more militants than it, they killed. Because